gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news about the person and the work of Christ is something that not only saves us, it continually saves us and sanctifies us and it infiltrates our life. Isn't it amazing how the world can change in one week? Even just a couple of days? That ever since last weekend, we've watched unfold on the news the tragedy unfolding in the Middle East, and our prayers should be with those suffering in Israel and some of the innocents that are caught in the crossfire in Gaza. And as we recognize the innocents caught in the crossfire on both sides, I also think it's important to remember as Christians in full objectivity the unequivocal evil that was exacerbated by those terrorists. Let's make no mistake on what is evil. When we talk about the reality of the world, sin and Satan are running amok, running scared. They know their time is short. They know that the Lord is coming. And so they will look to do everything they can to disrupt this world system. We need to be praying that the Lord would ingather people for his goodness and for salvation. And we also need to pray that we would be able to endure well as a people and demonstrate the love of God in a crazy world. How do we find our security and contentedness in a crazy world like the one we live in? Where do we anchor ourselves? How do we do it? Turn there with me, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 2, and we're going to read down to verse 10. As we think about contentment and satisfaction and peace, some look for contentment in circumstances, others in wealth. But what does Scripture say? How do we attain what Jeremiah Burroughs, the Puritan, called the rare jewel of Christian contentment? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 2. We're going to read down to verse 10. Teach and urge these things. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. Verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these will, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich and fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. In verse 3, we get the teaching distinctives that are supposed to characterize the church. Don't leave the words of Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness. In other words, Jesus and godliness. The teaching of the church should be characterized by these distinctives. This is the metric of the church, the obligation of the elders. It's what the saints, what you should expect from the teaching and from the instruction that comes from the church. And it is what the Spirit empowers. That when we come to church, we understand teaching that is godly, that is biblical, if it centers on Christ and if it produces godliness. Those are two critical aspects. Distraction from these priorities shows a foolish heart that understands nothing, that is literally puffed up with conceit, that it thinks that there are other priorities more important than Christ and being Christ-like. Different doctrines or things that are distracted from these two priorities produce several things that Paul lists down here in verse 4 down to verse 5. The teacher is characterized by one who has cravings for controversy and quarrels about words. They love to debate. They love to talk. They love to stir up for interesting conversation. But what does it produce? It doesn't produce godliness. It produces envy, dissension, slander, 
evil suspicions as we murmur amongst ourselves, constant friction, and then using godliness for personal gain and profit. And unfortunately, in the church today, there are no shortage of examples of those who would feign godliness in order to build up their personal bank account. Verse 6, but here's the main point. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. That is the big idea this morning, very simple. We're just kind of quoting it right from the text here. Godliness with contentment is great gain. It is the greatest gain. What is godliness? Let's parse these words for just a moment so we understand clearly. Godliness depends on two things. Number one, a soul that is reconciled with God through Christ. A soul that is reconciled with God through Christ. You cannot be godly unless you've been reconciled to God through the Son of God. We have to be very clear on that. It's the first part. The second part of godliness is a life that obediently and joyfully lives out what God values. The instructions of God. The commands of God. These are what God values. Holiness and righteousness. And so the godly person is the one who's been reconciled to God and who lives obediently and joyfully out that which God values. If you've not been reconciled to God through Christ, but you just do good things, you are religious, but you are not godly. True godliness is rooted only in Christ. So godliness. This is a reconciled person who is obediently living out what God values. Now, what is contentment? We talk about contentment. It has to do with satisfaction, with being at peace, finding sufficiency. Interestingly enough, the word here for contentment in the Greek is autarkes, which is usually used of God because the translation of this Greek word has to do with self-sufficiency, or being sufficient despite the circumstances. Usually when we think about contentment, the only one who can truly be content is God himself. He is the only fully self-sufficient being. He's the only one who lacks nothing, who needs nothing, and is completely satisfied in and of himself. He did not create because he needed creation. He did not create you because he needed you. He created creation because he wanted to. He created you just because he wanted you to experience his goodness. But he doesn't need us. He is fully self-sufficient, self-existent, and content. So true contentedness actually is a God-like characteristic. To be godly, to be content, they go hand in hand. A God-like characteristic, but unlike God, we don't find our contentment in ourselves, but we find our contentment in Christ alone. Now, in, in the same sense, the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they find contentment with each other other. And because we are in Christ, we're brought into Christ by the work of Christ on the cross, we are brought into the fellowship of the Trinity where we can, like God, find contentment with the other members of the Trinity so our soul lacks nothing. We can begin in this life to enjoy complete sufficiency, complete satisfaction, an unwavering and undisturbed existence based on who Christ is. We begin to enjoy that. We don't fully complete it this side of heaven. We begin into that journey. Jeremiah Burroughs, again, this Puritan, his definition of contentment is this. Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every circumstance. It's satisfaction. It's not needing anything else except God in every circumstance. In shorthand, contentment is satisfaction in Christ only. It is that Psalm 23, he is my shepherd, I shall not want. 
because I trust his heart. He's going to lead me through. He's going to take me through the valley of the shadow of death. And in the end, he's going to sit me down to feast at his table. And he's going to bring victory over the enemies. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall be content in him and him only. But if we're honest, contentment is so easily stolen away. And the Apostle Paul here is writing about those things that steal away that contentment and joy in Christ. And so this morning, I want to give you three statements. Three statements. One has to do with perspective. The second one has to do with a challenge. And the third one has to do with warfare. Number one, this is the statement on perspective. All earthly possessions have a very short shelf life. Number one, all earthly possessions have a very short shelf life. I need to rewrite that because short shelf, say that 10 times fast. It has to do with perspective. Now, what is is this perspective? Verse seven, for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. Now, looking at verse seven only, recognizing you are born with nothing. You come into the world naked, without anything, and you leave the world without anything. In Swahili, it's the word uchi. You come into the world uchi, without anything. You literally have nothing, not even clothes on your back. And guess what? You leave the world, and you can't take your clothes with you even. You come into the world with nothing, you leave with nothing. When you die, you leave everything behind. Here's a perspective that we must be reminded of. Everything you own will one day belong to someone else. Everything you own will one day belong to someone else. One day, everything that you own will simply just become dust. You can build it out of the best materials in the world. Choose the finest marble from Italy and Greece. And yes, you can go to those sites in Ephesus or Rome or Athens and see the majestic what? Ruins. They're glimpses into former glory, but they are reminded that at the height of human engineering and even beautifying of structures and working with stone and marble, they've built things that even today, I talked to an engineer who said, even with computers these days, it would be hard to reach the degree of precision that they achieved with their hands. And yet today they're crumbling into dust. Eventually, everything will turn to dust. Everything that you prize here on this earth will one day burn at the recreation of the world. It doesn't matter how long the shelf life is in relative terms here on earth. It doesn't matter if you build it out of marble or cardboard. At the end of time, when Jesus returns and he brings home the elect, his people, the saints, he will then recreate the universe without any blemish of sin. And everything in this current existence, save human souls, is going to burn. Now, human souls will spend then in eternity, either in joy or in eternal burning, in eternal decay or eternal joy. And the dependence on which direction we go hinges on one person, Jesus Christ. But it's a perspective that we must anchor into, that we must be reminded because we think let's lay up treasures here on this earth. Let's make sure the retirement portfolio and everything is taken care of. Now, don't misunderstand me. Use wisdom. Yes, save for retirement. Although does a Christian ever retire? Should they ever retire? Or do they just simply change tires and go into a different mode? Never take your tires off as a Christian. Just go from different speed tires at different phases of life. But as we think about our lives in perspective, Jesus gives a very convicting parable in Luke chapter 12, verse 16 to 21. Luke chapter 12, verse 16 to 21, Jesus tells this parable. The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. My garage is full. 
And he said, I'll build a four-car garage now. Verse 18, he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. I've got enough. I think I've got enough to ride out the rest of this life in fun, happiness, and entertainment. But God said to him, verse 20, fool, fool. Remember we talked about the fool last week? It's a very, very, very strong word in the scripture. It's an offensive word on the ears of the Hebrew. Fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. All earthly possessions have a very short shelf life. You brought nothing into the world, you will take nothing with you. Second statement and second perspective has to do with a challenge, a challenge to us. And here's the second statement. True contentment is not dependent on the stuff of this world. True contentment is not dependent on the stuff of this world. And the challenge to you is this, verse 8. But if we have food and clothing, with these will we be content. With food and clothing, with these will we, we will be content. Food and clothing, Paul says, is enough. But let's ask the question. I mean, could we say that? Do, do I have a little bit of food? I'm not talking about lobster thermidor. I'm talking about just gruel that allows me to get through the day and some bits of clothing. These are the absolute basic necessities of life. Paul actually makes a statement that contentment is simplistic. These are the absolute basics of existence. Now, I want to make a parenthetical statement here. I'm not saying you have to live like a monk. God gives blessings and he gives gifts. Frankly, I'm thankful for my comfortable shoes and I'm thankful for my comfortable shirt. I'm thankful for this device that I'm able to preach off of. Praise God for air conditioning and heat and padded chairs, amen? All right. Praise God and thank him for his gifts. But never anchor your contentment on them. Your joy, your satisfaction. How can you be content with nothing and be thankful just simply for food and clothing? How can you be content with such basic necessities? Well, before we answer that question, let's just ask, what do you need to be content? Like, like think carefully. What are the things in life that you actively or passively require to find contentment and satisfaction? Is it a well-paying job? And if it's not well-paying, do you complain? Are you stressed? Is it a good employer? Maybe a nice house. Maybe it's routine travel and experiences. Frankly, this, one, this is one that I, that I have to be careful of. I love to travel. I love new experiences. Man, I could just blow money doing and having those experiences. I thank God for the gifts of them. I enjoy it. We have to be careful. Living for vacation, perhaps. Or, or do I need my hobbies and entertainment? Beware that hobby that becomes a God. Beware the hobbies that go from gift to God. Do you need the affection of others to be content? I'm only happy if everybody else is happy. I'm only content if everybody's happy with me. Do you need comfortable savings to be content? Do you need nice clothes? Do you need good looks? You're not content unless you can look in the mirror and say, good morning, beautiful. <laughs> what about control? You need control, and when you don't have control... 
you struggle with being satisfied in life. Good health, maybe. I'm only content if I feel good. The rest of the time, it's, uh oh, woe is me. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not making light of any of these things. These can be heavy burdens. But the question is, where do we anchor our contentment? Is it contentment rooted in the right president or the right government or the right situation and circumstance? Now, understand me very clearly, please. Most of these things are not wrong within and in and of themselves. Matter of fact, most sins begin as gifts taken out of their context. You understand that? Most sins begin as gifts that are taken out of their context. Your good house, God's provision, thank God, disenthrall yourself from anchoring your contentment there. Use them generously. Use them thankfully. And don't live for them. If you get to go on vacation, enjoy it. If you have good health, thank God for it. But don't anchor yourself there. Do any or several of these, by the way, resound with you? Do any of these things govern your ability to be content? Proverbs 16, 8, better is a little with righteousness than great revenues with injustice. In other words, better is a little bit with contentment that is good than trying to seek it out by unrighteousness. Proverbs 15, 15 to 17, better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and the trouble that comes with it. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fattened ox and hatred with it. Psalm 37, 16. Better is the little that the righteous has than the abundance of many wicked. So how can you be content with so little? Even picking up in those Psalms, what is the thing that unites the little? It is that righteousness. It's that godliness. How can you be content with only food and clothing if that's what the circumstances that God ordains and brings to you? It is godliness. It is being satisfied with God, believing God's word that what is to come because of the work of Christ, because of the hope that we have in Christ is far better than anything this world can offer. Therefore, I can be patient and wait on the word of the Lord And though I have food and clothing only, I know one day I'm going to have food abundant. And I know I'm going to be robed in the very glory of Christ in heaven. And I'm going to keep the best company in the universe at the side of God himself. So if for a few measly decades I have to walk through some things in order to demonstrate God's goodness and faithfulness, like Paul said, I have learned to be content. Learned. So in a pass or fail grade, this is a grade of growth. Are you growing in contentment? Are you growing in satisfaction? Or is the graph reversed? Is it trending the other way? Well, maybe one of the reasons is because of point number three. The third point has to do with warfare. So the first point that had to do with perspective, number one, all earthly possessions have a very short shelf life. Number two is a challenge to us that true contentment is not dependent on the stuff of the world. And then number three that has to do with warfare, the third statement is the desire for wealth is a path of pain, loss, and heartache. The desire for wealth is a path of pain, loss, and heartache. Why is this a warfare statement? Because everything in the world shouts the opposite. Everything in the world says that actually wealth will make me happy. That contentment comes from stuff. That make as much money as possible is a good thing. Because it will add to my satisfaction and contentment. The notion that wealth will satisfy, that stuff will satisfy is some of the very core elements of demonic teaching. 
And so Paul is challenging this mindset. Listen to him what he says, verse 9. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. It doesn't say those who are rich as if like having financial wealth automatically makes it sinful. No, you can actually be poor and be consumed with a desire to be wealthy. It is the heart affection that we're talking about. The world says, wealth will make me happy. And then we as the church, we have these Christian adaptations of these lies. One of which is, well, God wants the best for me, so God wants me to be wealthy and rich and successful. No, he wants you to be godly. There's a big difference between those two things. Another lie is, and I hear this from younger people quite often, I want to make lots of money and be successful so that I can give to missions. I can give to the church. Because if I'm rich and successful, I'll have more to give. Uh, Let me encourage you to rearrange your goals, whether young or old, brother, sister. Be godly and be giving now. Be godly and sacrificial now. And if God gives you more wealth, you will have already proven your worthiness. Be faithful now. Don't make your goal to be wealthy. Make your goal to be godly. And if God ordains a simple, poor life, then be godly and rejoice. And if God ordains that you should have influence and financial power, may that godliness that begin here carry through so that your wealth simply is a channel that flows through to the blessing of the world, to the blessing of the nations. Another lie is that if I give, God will give me more. I am going to challenge something that I grew up hearing all the time. You cannot outgive God. I do agree with that. However, if you think that tithing or giving, whatever your principle of giving, and by the way, I would say that Scripture teaches sacrificial giving, and that is an act of worship between you and the Lord versus a a, a material absolute 10%, and I think in many times it surpasses that. But here's the point. Is that you do not give in order to get. You do not see God as a return on investment. Sometimes giving, brothers and sisters, just hurts in terms of its material impact. But it is always, first and foremost, an act of worship. If we give to get, giving to gain, godliness to profit, did he not just say that in verse 5? Some who use godliness for personal gain. But giving to gain or godliness to profit is patently pagan in practice and principle. You come and you bring your altars to the divinity, to the idol. I'm giving. Now you're going to give me a good harvest, right? I'm giving. That means I'm going to be healthy, right? Well, the reason I'm falling into hardship is because I didn't give as much to the church last week. Brother and sister, that is a fundamental misunderstanding of worship. And it is much more in common with pagan practices than anything that is Christian. The desire for wealth, we must understand, is a, if not the prime enemy of godliness and contentment. The desire for wealth is the prime enemy of godliness and contentment. If you look at verse 10, it says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. Also could be translated, the root of all evil. Luke chapter 8, verse 14 to 15. Jesus tells the parable that the sower goes out to sow seeds of the gospel. 
Some falls on the path, some falls on good soil, some on rocky soil, some among thorns, and this is what he says in verse 14. And as for what fell among the thorns, there are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. And for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. The image here is that the gospel takes root, it begins to flower, the weeds pop up, choke out the plant. It does not kill it, but chokes it out so that instead of getting these big, beautiful fruits, you get these half-formed, malnourished, and ultimately eaten by the birds and the bugs before you ever get to enjoy it. I have tried planting blueberries, raspberries, apples. I don't know how any of you guys make anything grow. I'm just going to go to Kroger. <laughs> I've spent so much money on trying to grow things in my yard, thinking it will save, save money. I mean, it's ridiculous. And you know what it is? It's just unbelievable. Like, I, I, he'll pull up one root, and another one is like there, like staring me in the face as I'm plucking up the other one. I come back the next day, and it grows even quicker. And then by the time you, you, you think you have these, these beautiful trees, and then bagworms come and chew them up. Oh. I'll tell you what, fall is real. People who want to get back to nature are just going to die sooner. <laughs> I know there's this movement of people that are like, hey, let's get closer to nature. You know what nature's trying to do? It's trying to kill you. <laughs> I thank God for my house, and I like to look at nature through my window. <laughs> and occasional hikes, right? But you always come back to your air-conditioned padded car, and how many of you, after your three-hour hike, you're like, oh, this car seat feels so good. All right, so as we talk about, where was I going with that? Yeah, choke, 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 fruit of the plant. Bottom line is the, the thorns choke out the fruit. And here's the reality, is that some of you, my brothers and sisters, are truly brothers and sisters. You are believers, but you don't bear fruit of the Spirit of God because you love this world. Because your heart is oriented how to be successful, how to be wealthy, how to get more out of my social security check instead of being godly. It doesn't matter what stage of life you're at. Your, your love for stuff and pleasure, your thoughts consumed with the cares and riches actually choke your maturity. You do not mature in the faith because the thorns of wealth strangle your godliness. What are the pitfalls of the pursuit of the path of prosperity and wealth? Orienting your life for stuff and contentment and money and finding satisfaction there. Well, it says right here, Paul says, those who desire to be rich, that's, that's their goal, that's their aim, they fall into temptation. You know what wealth does? Wealth increases our access to sin. It does. Wealth increases your access to sin. It increases the opportunity to be tempted by more wealth and buy more stuff. It's a snare, Paul says. You know what a snare is? It's a trap that doesn't easily let go. It exposes you to senseless and harmful desires, harmful to you and to others. Brothers and sisters, we are seeing the love of money and stuff played out on a geopolitical scale where the reason that Russia invented, invaded Ukraine is because Ukraine has stuff and resources that Putin wants. And what's the result of that greed and not being content with what you have and not being content with what you own? The result has now produced tens of thousands of deaths, senseless, harmful desires. And it brings ruin and destruction. It destroys families, homes, and happiness. The love of money is the root of all evils. Money is not evil in and of itself. But it is the foremost agency through which evil blossoms. You would be foolish to misunderstand that though e money in and of itself is not evil, we all use it, it is in and of itself not evil, Scripture has so much to say about money, and again and again, it describes it as the foremost agent through which evil is channeled and accomplished. 
Hebrews 13, verse 5 to 6, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Matthew 6, 19 to 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal, for there your your treasure is, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, what is that gain? What is that great gain? What is it that we as believers are waiting for and looking towards? What are those eternal riches? It's the wealth of heaven. It's not the wealth of the earth. It's the wealth of heaven. Now, what is the wealth of heaven? I've got seven wealths of heaven, which I think might need to be a sermon later. But right now, it's going to suffer as a tangent. But seven wealths of heaven by which godliness with contentment is great gain. And that gain here is wealth number one in heaven. Relational wealth. Relational wealth. Even most secular people, if they said, what is the thing that matters most to you? Is it not the ones you love? Your spouse, your loved one, your children, those who are closest, that relational wealth far exceeds anything else, even by secular standards. What is the relational wealth that we look forward to in heaven? It is God himself as father, brother, and friend. Relational wealth. Number two, character wealth. The wealth of Nathan's character is plagued with sin. But in heaven, the character wealth that I look forward to enjoying is sin purged out of me so that within Nathan Smith resides only righteousness, holiness, completed in the holy nature of God. I can't wait to get to heaven and experience the wealth of character free of sin. Relational wealth, character wealth. Number three, positional wealth. Wealth is not just stuff. Wealth is honor, position, Do you not know that if you are in Christ, you are destined to reign with Christ in the heavenlies? You're not going to heaven as a servant. You're going to heaven as a child of God, to reign with God in Christ forever and ever. Relational character, positional wealth. Number four, enlightened wealth. The wealth of the mind. Scientists say we use, what, 10% of our brain? When that brain in heaven is glorified and removed from the restraints of sin and frailty, the basest and the meanest among us in heaven will become the most brilliant mind relative to anyone here on earth. It is the wealth of a mind now opened up in Christ to be able to behold glories and majesties that we never before could have comprehended to understand and compute complexities of the physicalities of heaven and the universe like never before. It is a wealth of mind that you cannot even imagine what awaits for you. Number five, physical wealth. This is a wealth where the body is stripped of any imperfections. It is only beauty, only a body without defects. Number six, emotional wealth, purified affection so that the wealth of my emotions only and ever and always feel joy, satisfaction, happiness, peace, love. How many of us would trade everything we own so that our emotions could enjoy those. And how many people have pierced themselves with many pangs, though they own billions of dollars and yet lay their head down at night in anxiety and fear and isolation? Number seven. When we think about the wealth of heaven, by the way, I think we jump to this one and we miss out on those other ones. And I put it last intentionally because number seven, yes, is material wealth, but actually I would rank it last. Are there streets of gold? Yeah. I mean, I don't mean to dismiss heaven. Please don't misunderstand that. Are there mansions? Yeah. You know what the greatest wealth of heaven is? It's God. It's righteousness. It's holiness. It's purity unstained forever and evermore. 
Godliness with contentment is great gain. And this wealth of gain was not free. It was given at a great price where Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins so that you could be reconciled to God and that you could enjoy all the gain that he left and humbled himself to in order that you might be exalted to his station. The gospel disposition, the life under the gospel power and rule is content no matter what. What? Because if I have only food and clothing on this side of heaven, guess what? Those seven wealths of heaven that I just listed in my frailty are beyond anything that this world has to offer. What's your action point this morning? Brother and sister, sell the field for the treasure. Look for the pearl of righteousness and godliness. Reorient your life Pursue godliness because godliness with contentment is the greatest gain and nothing even compares. Would you pray with me this morning? Oh, Heavenly Father, help us to reorient and focus our lives to be godly, to find our contentment in Christ alone, to look forward to those wealths of heaven that we have only begun to imagine. Help us not to lay up for ourselves treasures here on earth, but help us to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven by being obedient to the call, by going to the nations, by being a faithful engineer, by being a faithful doctor, stay-at-home mom, or wherever position you are. Stay-at-home dad. Oh my goodness, Lord, I pray that you would fill us with your goodness. I pray, oh God, that we would take our vocations and our roles and glorify you through them so that truly we are foremost known not as the engineer, not as the doctor, not as the pastor, but rather we are known as those who are godly in Christ. May we sell the field to attain the treasure, not build a faulty mansion on a field that will one day burn. Oh God, help us to be faithful. Help my brothers and sisters, help me. And in Jesus' name we pray all of these things. Amen.